Welcome to A Dram of Outlander. This is Desiree, your podcaster and the writer for adramofoutlander.com. For all things Outlander, from the Diana Gabaldon book series to the Stars TV series and everything in between. This is episode 62, week 20 of the Voyager Read Along, chapters 53 through 55. Hello there, welcome back. Yes, I know I sound a bit froggy. I did get a cold this week. And as long as my voice holds out, I'm carrying on. News from Outlander World this week. The Outlander show won a Critics' Choice Award for Most Bingeworthy Watch. I have watched season one quite a bit. Katrina Balfe was nominated for a Golden Globe Award. Go, Cat! It's super exciting. Meryl Davis, producer, did a spontaneous short question and answer on Twitter, and I did write a blog post on it, so it's on adramofoutlander.com. But the highlights from it are that there will be a Mr. Willoughby in season three. I know people were speculating as to whether or not they'd have that character. The ship scenes and the Caribbean scenes will be filmed in South Africa. That's where Black Sails had their ships and all their sets. This week, the printer shop scene was being shot. That is very exciting. And Meryl said they're about halfway through filming season three, and they're going to be taking their Christmas break soon. There will not be a break in shooting between seasons three and four. So they're going to be working right through to the next book. And she also gave some detail and background on how long production takes. Check out the blog post. You'll be glad you did. And I want to thank you for again joining me at my table for conversation and a dram of Outlander. All right, let's jump in. Part 9, Worlds Unknown. Chapter 53, Bat Guano. Ten tons of bat guano from Barbados to Jamaica for Mr. Gray Sugar Planter is the cargo Fergus secures to transport, and it reeked of musk, ammonia, and decay. Mmm, yummy, in the hot Caribbean sun. Claire describes it as in the air, sticking to the men loading it, and Jamie wants to keelhaul Fergus. That means to punish someone by dragging them through the water under the keel of a ship, either across the width or from the bow to stern. That was shown this week on Vikings, actually. Rolo was keel-hauled to become a Viking again. Everyone's eyes were streaming with tears. But Fergus is totally indignant about his choice. We are meant to be traitors, no? And besides, Monsieur Gray will pay us more than adequately. And it's a three- or four-day sail. Fergus assures them the stench will subside. Fergus is so invested because half the profits will be his against the dowry Jamie promised Marcelie. Claire tells Jamie she really wants to read the letter Marcelie is writing to Leary. First Fergus, I mean, then Father Fogden and Mama Sita, and now a dowry of ten tons of batshit? <laughs> God, seriously, that has hilarity written all over it. What an auspicious start to a marriage. Jamie says he'll never be able to set foot in Scotland again. And it seems that Claire herself has a new acquisition. A he. But we don't know who he yet. And he has been fed and a place found for him by Innes. And now Jamie has a visitor. It must be a Freemason. The network was vast and Jamie had spoken to the master of the lodge about young Ian and the Bruja. The planter had a paper for Jamie. Claire could not read Jamie's expression. She goes on to explain that she, Lawrence, Fergus, and Marcelie had gone to the slave market. This gets a little dicey here. We have 20th and 21st century sensibilities in westernized culture. There are still people enslaved around our beautiful world. And it's horrifying that a human can own another human. And Claire is from the 20th century. So this is going to be quite in her face, as I'm sure it would be ours. They are chaperoned by a cranky Murphy. The market had sellers of fruit, coffee, dried fruits, coconuts, yams, and bugs sold for dye. And Murphy made Fergus purchase two parasols for Claire and Marcelie to be respectable about keeping their fine skin fine. Claire, of course, argued with Murphy before finally taking it from him. And within 10 minutes, she was grateful for Murphy's intransigence because there was no shade in the marketplace, and it was hot and the sun was beating down. She speaks of the slaves and how they're held in large pens at the side of the square open to the elements, 
It's so disdainful that this was the norm. Claire tells us what she sees, bodies naked or nearly so, in all shades from cafe au lait to deep blue black. This smell was overwhelming with human waste and hot bare flesh being baked in the sun, worse than even the porpoise tween decks. That says a lot that this smelled worse than her being in the midst of the typhoid epidemic. Fergus even remarks how it's worse than the slums of Montmartre. Lawrence seemed the only one unaffected. He showed them where the white people were sold because they're looking for a young Ian, remember. They witness slaves being branded, and Claire is stopped dead at this. She can't stop looking. But the others kept walking, and soon she couldn't pick any of them out in the crowd. She turned away from the scene and hurriedly went past several auction blocks with her eyes averted until she was forced to slow and stop by a dense group of people. Can you imagine witnessing humans being branded and sold into slavery? It turns my stomach and angers me that it still happens in our world. And it brings me to tears. An auctioneer was extolling the virtues of a one-armed slave. He was standing naked for inspection. The auctioneer claimed he would be good for breeding since he couldn't work in the fields. And a man in the crowd asked if virility would be guaranteed. It's quite a disturbing scene. Guarantee? See for yourselves, O ye of little faith. And the auctioneer grabs the slave's penis and begins to massage it to show he could become erect. And the crowd heckles and begins to laugh. And the slave didn't like it at all. The humiliation. At this, Claire snapped. She basically lost her shit. <laughs> and she heard it inside of herself. She was outraged by all of it, the market, the branding, the crude talk, the casual indignity, and at herself for being there. And this was the tipping point. And without meaning to, she couldn't even stop herself. She yelled, stop it! The auctioneer looked at her and again said what sound breeding stock he is. Overcome, Claire closes her parasol and she stabs him with the tip of it in his belly. Then she smashed him on the head with it as hard as she could. She couldn't consent by being silent in the matter. People pulled her off the auctioneer, and he slapped the slave hard in the face. Claire created mayhem here. Fergus spots her and is coming through the crowd, and she's tripped to the ground. Then she spots Murphy. Through a haze of dust, I saw Murphy six feet away. With a resigned expression on his broad red face, he bent, detached his wooden leg, straightened up, and hopping gracefully forward, brought it down with a great force on the auctioneer's head. The man tottered and fell as the crowd surged back, trying to get out of the way. I can see a stocky, barrel-chested Murphy with his Irish temperament doing this. <laughs> and Fergus stops by the fallen man, and Lawrence is also coming their way with his hand on his knife. Claire suddenly realizes that she has made a huge mistake that could get the men beaten badly or worse. And then there was Jamie. He hoists her to her feet, and she sees the Scots around him. And at this she swoons. Do something, please do something, she says. Jamie did the only thing he could. He bought the slave. And the irony of Claire's outrage left her being the appalled owner of this guinea slave. She wouldn't even touch the papers of ownership. In the papers, he was described as a full-blooded Gold Coast Negro, a Yoruba sold by a French planter from Barbuda, one-armed bearing a brand on the left shoulder of a fleur-de-lis and the initial A, and known by the name Temeraire, the bold one, the papers did not suggest what in the name of God she was to do with him. Jamie was meeting with the Masonic acquaintance and reading some papers of ownership he had with him. Jamie was disappointed. Three days prior, six slaves were sold to him from the Bruja, but young Ian was not among them. The ship had left Hispaniola two weeks prior, must have stopped somewhere else before Barbados, Villiers, the plantation owner Jamie spoke to, did not know where else the Bruja had been. 
He shared with Jamie he had spoken to the captain of the Bruja, who was very secretive about where they had been. Villiers hadn't thought much of it, and he did get the slaves for a good price. Ugh. Still, Villiers did show me the papers for the slaves he'd bought. You'll have seen those for your slave? Claire bristles at this and doesn't like Jamie calling him her slave. Some of the slaves Villiers had bought were formerly owned by a Mrs. Abernathy of Rose Hall, Jamaica. Jamie thinks they should go to Jamaica next, not only to look for young Ian, but to offload the wretched bat ship before they die in disgust. <laughs> he wrinkles his nose and Claire says he looks like an anteater. They discuss the volume of ants that must be eaten to satisfy such a beastie. And she thinks it couldn't be worse than haggis after all. But I think haggis is quite tasty myself. Then a heavy, sinister smell mixes with the dead barnacles, wet wood, fish, rotted seaweed, and the tropical vegetation from the docks. They were passing the burning ground. The bodies of the slaves who die in passage are burned there. They ask how often bodies are burned, maybe once a week. They needed to look in case young Ian was among the dead. There was a keeper of the burning ground, and it's described as a small hollow set behind a screen of trees convenient to a small wharf that extended into the river. Black smeared pitch barrels and piles of dry wood stood in grim, sticky clumps amid the brilliant greens of tree ferns and dwarf pointiana. To the right, a huge pyre had been built with a platform of wood onto which the bodies had been thrown, dribbled with pitch. And they had recently been fired, and there was a good blaze. Smoke obscured the bodies, and it rolled up over the heaps. But Jamie stopped looking at the scene in front of him, and he jumped in and began to pull the bodies apart, going through the remains, looking for a young Ian. This is utterly horrifying. That is how desperate he is to find young Ian. The man who tended the pyre told Claire the ashes are good for crop growth. And she said, no, thank you. And the smell in the air made her feel sick. And she worried Jamie had fallen in and was burning too. She called for him. And then she hears him coughing and choking on the smoke. He emerged covered in oily soot Pitch smeared his hands and clothes, and his eyes ran from the smoke. He was blinded. She gave coins to the pyre keeper before getting Jamie out of there. When they reached the palms, he fell to his knees and vomited. This is nightmare fuel. I can't imagine even witnessing an open pyre of burning bodies. But to jump in, because you have to find your nephew... That was stolen. That is a burden I hope no one ever has to bear, or anything even similar to it. But Jamie is courageous, and he is brave, and he loves his family. They mean everything to him. He wouldn't let Claire touch him. He walked to the edge of the dock, took off his coat and shoes, then jumped into the water fully clothed. She carefully picked up the shoes and coat, holding them far away from her, and she notices Bree's pictures in his coat pocket. When he emerged from the water, he was still covered in pitch, but the soot and fire smell had gone. The men from the Artemis curiously looked at him, and Claire simply puts her hand on his shoulder, and he takes it. He says, Ian, young Ian, wasn't there. After all their travels, now they're moving closer and closer to Ian. At least we hope so. Chapter 54, The Impetuous Pirate Claire tells Jamie... She cannot own anyone. He agrees with her, but wonders what they are supposed to do with the man. He was sitting next to her, holding the ownership documents. He posits they could set him free. It is the right thing to do, but the man speaks little French or English and has no skills. If they set him free, even with some money, could he manage on his own? Could he survive? And Claire is eating a cheese biscuit that Murphy made, but the smell from the lamp and the bat guano... They're permeating her enjoyment. Claire explains that Lawrence said there were many free blacks on Hispaniola. But Jamie doesn't think that Jamaica has many free blacks, and those that are have a trade, unlike Temeraire. 
Claire, though disgusted by owning a slave, realizes quickly it might be more difficult than she thought to change the situation. I'd say this is Facebook status. It's complicated. Originally, she thought to return him to his homeland, but sending him on a ship toward Africa would probably help him get enslaved right away. Alone, he would have little protection. If he did make it back to Africa, to his village, Lawrence explained they would turn him away and treat him as a ghost. They wouldn't know him anymore. And Jamie wonders if they could maybe sell him to someone who would treat him well. But Claire doesn't think that's any better than them owning him. It may be even worse. And Jamie sighs from exhaustion. He'd been climbing through the stinking holds with Fergus doing inventory. And he says, but setting him free to starve was also not a good idea. Social constructs are complex. And things do not often change quickly. When people are used to something, it's what they do. A thousand years ago, if a woman was widowed and didn't have anything of her own to care for herself, she could be sent to a nunnery to live her life out because now she's useless. How awesome is that? And it's terrifying how long it took things to change. I mean, we didn't get the right to vote in the United States until not that long ago as women. Claire wished she'd never seen the one-armed slave because it would be easier for her, but maybe not for him. I can understand her desire to wish that. This is a big mess. Jamie stood and stretched and kissed her between the brows. Dinner, Fash Sassanok. I'll speak to the manager at Jared's plantation. Perhaps he can find the man some employment or else. But his sentence was interrupted by a yell of, Ship ahoy! And Jamie began to react, and then a crash drowned his words, and the cabin tilted. They are both all right. But they realized they were being boarded by pirates. He tells her to take Marceline and go down to the aft holds with the guano. Awesome. First, Claire looks for her bag from Mother Hildegard, and she digs for her scalpels to have in hand as weapons. Mother Claire, Marceline calls. I love this. This shows Marceline's acceptance of Claire. She sees her as a stepmother. She sees her as someone that she loves and cares for. And she hands Marceline a letter opener to have in her own hand. And then Claire finds her amputation blade to go with the scalpels, just in case. They discuss the idea that it is pirates trying to take them over. She and Marcely found their way and waited. Marcely prayed for Fergus as the sounds of battle carried on above them. And Claire echoed a silent prayer for Jamie. Then she crossed herself and touched the spot he'd last kissed. It might be the last touch forever. This is such a dangerous time still. We live in incredible safety in comparison. We live in this bubble that is not afforded too many people in this world. There was an explosion overhead. Marcely panics and said they would drown down there if the ship gets sunk. And Marcely runs off against Claire telling her to stay. And then Claire hears Marcely shriek and a half-naked man had her in his clutches. Clinical Claire reports he was an obese man. His fat rolls were decorated with tattoos. A necklace of coins were about his neck. Marcely tries to slap him. And then he notices Claire and grins terribly at her. So what does Claire do? Well, Claire decides to cuss at him. She calls him a basta cavron. <laughs> but basically, she told him, enough bastard, or something to that effect. Because she wants him to let Marcely go, and he laughs at her. So she throws a scalpel at him. He ducks wildly. And Marcely gets away up the ladder, but then he catches her by the foot as she was almost through the hatch. Are you getting tense now? Getting some adrenaline? And Claire is cursing under her breath and runs over and swings the amputation blade at his foot as hard as she can. And he screeches. And then something winged past her head as a spray of blood hits her face. Ooh. And Claire steps back to see what went past her head. It just happened to be a small brown toe, calloused and black-nailed, while being smudged with dirt. 
What a lovely vision that is. <laughs> but that didn't stop this guy. He came after Claire, tearing her sleeve, but she's feisty, and she jabbed at his face with the blade in her hand. And then he slips on his own blood and falls. And at this point, she is climbing the ladder out of the hold as fast as she can. But he's right on her, and he grabs her hem, but she gets away from him as he yells at her in another language. And she thought maybe Portuguese, somewhere in the back of her mind. <laughs> she has an interesting brain, our Claire. On deck, there's complete chaos everywhere, and in desperation, because the man was coming for her, she starts to climb the rigging. Now Claire is in a dress, and she's not a sailor, and she knew right away it was a mistake. He was a sailor and could climb the rigging far better than her, even with the toe cut off. He got so close to her that he spit at her face, and she kept climbing, and he kept pace. More adrenaline. She didn't need to understand the language he was yelling at her. His message was clear. He wanted to kill her. He took out his cutlass and slashed at her. But he seems to have missed. And then Claire just closes her eyes, hoping it'll be a quick death. And then she hears a thunk. And she sees Ping On, the bird, Willoughby's bird, making noise at her. So... Ping Ong must have scared the pirate right off the rigging. And Claire thought that the bird liked Portuguese pirates as much as he liked noise. And she began to feel a bit lightheaded and notices the noise stopped below. The pirate ship began to pull away. It was over. And slowly she made her way down the rigging back to the deck. She notices that black powder covered everything and that there were bodies on the deck. And she searched, and she found Jamie's hair, and her heart leapt. He was sitting on a cask near the wheel with a whiskey in his hand. Willoughby was giving whiskey first aid to Willie McLeod also. You know, the water of life and all. Claire began to feel giddy and shaky, not unlike shock. And she thought she could use some whiskey herself. As she clumsily landed on deck, Jamie looked up. And she asks if he's all right. There's a small gash in his hairline. And then she notices his sleeve has bright blood on it and says, he's bleeding. And she begins to feel numb in her limbs. My God, it's no my blood, Sassanok. It's yours. So I guess the cutlass had met its mark after all. But the adrenaline caused her not to feel it. What comes next is absolutely sparkly heart adorable. Marcy Lee is losing her mind that Claire is going to die. It's obvious how much she loves Claire now. She's bonded to her. And Claire is her family. And she can't stand the idea of losing her. This makes me just get all warm and fuzzy and feel badly for Leary at the same time. And Marcy Lee is doing the Scottish healing practice of covering Claire with heaps of blankets and such to keep her warm. And Claire feels like she's boiling to death. She would like to be uncovered, but Jamie told Marceline to keep her warm. And as Claire tries to free herself from under the covers, pain shot through her, and she saw spots. Lie still, said a stern Scots voice, through a wave of giddy sickness. Aye, that's right. Lie back on my arm. All right now, Sassanok? But she's not. She's going to be sick. Her arm felt as if fiery knives were being jabbed into it. Jesus H. Roosevelt Christ, she said. And she grumpily pointed out that she's not dead. And Jamie says Fergus will be glad to hear it. She asked what happened, and he has an answer all right. What happened? What happened, she says. Aye, what indeed. I tell you to stay all snug below with Marcy Lee, and the next thing I can, you've dropped out of the sky and landed at my feet, sopping with blood. He glared at her. He was considerably more ferocious when viewed stubbled, bloodstained, and angry at a distance of six inches, Claire reports. She shut her eyes, and he demanded she look at him. His eyes were narrow with fury. He tells her about her wound. Do you ken you came damn close to dying? You've a bone-deep slash down your arm from oxter to elbow, and had I not got a cloth round it in time, you'd be feeding the sharks this minute. 
His fist smashed the side of the berth next to her. She had scared the daylights out of him. An oxter is an underarm or an armpit. Damn you, woman! Will you never do as you're told? Probably not, she said. <laughs> Claire, well, she doth speak the truth. <laughs> He scowled but couldn't hide a smile. God, what I wouldn't give to have you tied face down over a gun and me with a rope's end in my hand. He yells for Willoughby to bring brandied tea. Nobody makes better tea than the English, she muses, except the Chinese. And Mr. Willoughby takes pride in this comment. Jamie estimates that Claire lost about half her blood on the deck. Now, in modern time, she'd be getting bags of IV fluids and maybe something called hemabate, or she'd be getting a blood transfusion. Whiskey or brandy is really not going to bring her blood volume up adequately. She needs water and rest. And as he's talking to her and says he's going to doctor her arm, she tells Willoughby, Jamie is mad at me. Not angry, samey, scared, very bad. Yeah, I think Willoughby's right. And Willoughby says he will help her. Remember, Willoughby has some training or had experiences with the traveling apothecaries in China. Jamie and Fergus return with her medicine box and two bottles of brandy. As Jamie inspects the wounds, as Jamie inspected the wound, she could see he was right. It was a very deep cut, gaping widely at the edges. She needed suturing. It was slowly bleeding still, but no major vessels seemed to be severed. I love how we go from this intensity of him being angry and upset because she's hurt and could have died. And she goes into her clinical mode and then comes back out of it and goes right back in like we're getting reported at the hospital. There was no laudanum on board. Jared's brandy would have to do. She wonders if she needs to stay half sober to supervise because there's no way she could suture herself. And she wonders what the second bottle of brandy is for, and Jamie tells her it was to cleanse the wound prior to suturing. She had completely forgotten about disinfection. It doesn't matter who you are or what you do. When you're in the situation, when you're the patient, when you need medical care, you're not thinking totally in that way. You can't look at yourself that way. And she thinks that though Highlanders were among the most stoic and courageous, and seamen were not far behind... She could do all sorts of things to them without anesthetic, and they take it. However, when it comes to disinfection, the screams could be heard for miles. Jamie puts her in his lap, with Fergus assisting. And Claire was trying to stall for time. And she brings up an Ernest Hemingway reference in her mind about passing out from pain, but it never really does happen. And she comes out of her pain fog... To Fergus saying, Please, my lady, you must not scream like that. It upsets the men. She saw it upset Fergus and the faces peering in the cabin door. And she thought she and Jamie were both shaking at this point. They got her to the captain's chair. And Jamie was holding one of her suture needles and her cat gut suture. And Willoughby intervened and took it from Jamie. He said he could do it. Claire and Jamie were so relieved, they laughed. I think I could suture my husband if needed, but I don't think my husband could suture me. It would freak him out too much. And then she has this flashback moment. And to think. I once told Bree that big men were kind and gentle, and the short ones tended to be nasty. Remember way back when they first met Roger Mack? He tells Claire he doesn't want her ever to do this again. And Willoughby returns with a roll of green silk and the wee stabbers, as Jamie calls them, the acupuncture needles. He explains as he goes from Claire's hand to her shoulder and he places the needles for pain management. And Claire was becoming interested as he was working on her and humming as he went. She wasn't sure if they really helped or not. And Jamie held her left hand and told her to breathe she had been holding her breath. This is a very common thing that happens when somebody is anticipating great pain or anticipating something terrible. We will hold our breath, which makes it worse, actually. Nice, slow, 
Diaphragmatic breathing will send endorphins through your lymph system and you will be more relaxed and it will hurt less. Truth. And Willoughby be sang a song while he was suturing her. And Jamie explained it's a Chinese pillow song and Claire was hoping that he would be finished before he got to the feet part. <laughs> that really freaks her out. Really freaks me out too. <laughs> the foot binding. Jamie tells her it's a wicked slash and guesses it was made by a cutlass, maybe. She tells him she's sure it was a cutlass. And then he wonders why they attacked. Maybe they could get the ship itself and get a fair price for it, with or without the cargo. We don't know the pirate ship's name, but the Bruja had been in the area recently. Claire was about to tell him about the language the pirate had been speaking when Fergus interrupts saying they found a dead pirate on board with his head bashed in. All three men looked at Claire, and she smiles. Sassanok, Jamie said. She tried to tell him, but... And this was all while Willoughby was finishing up. Fergus put the necklace the pirate had been wearing on the table. It had many objects on it, as well as jingling coins. And there was something familiar. The Tetradrachum, twin heads of Alexander. Fourth century B.C. coin in mint condition. Dun, dun, dun! We're getting somewhere that had to have come out of the box that was on Seal Island. And after all the adventures of this day, Claire slept fitfully. And she awakened to searing pain in her arm. She thought she might be feverish. And I'm thinking, break out the last of the penicillin, Beecham. Come on. She went to get up for water and woke Jamie, who was sleeping on the floor. They talk. And no, she didn't feel it when it happened. I could see you didn't. That's what frightened me. You never feel a fatal wound, Sassanok. And Murtaugh had told him that. She thought of Murtaugh and that he died at Culloden, and Jamie hadn't mentioned him since she returned to him. He told her they burned the bodies at Culloden, too. And he wondered what it would be like when it was his turn. He found out the answer that morning when he was searching through the corpses for young Ian. He went to Culloden to die. Not the rest of them. He did. But somehow he made it across the field and halfway back while men were being cut down all around him. Why? Why, Claire? Why am I alive and they're not? She didn't know. Maybe for his sister, his family, for her? He protests that the other men had families and children and sweethearts, and they are gone and he lives. There's no knowing, Claire says. He cannot help asking, especially when Murtaugh comes to mind. Mm, we all love Murtaugh, the best wingman ever. He says they should have fought sooner because the men were standing for hours waiting for Bonnie Prince to give the order from his safe place. And it was a relief when the English fired. They knew the cause was lost, yet they stood waiting. The guns roared. The men fell. Those left standing charged with swords in their hands. Gaelic shrieking, lost in the wind and gunfire. Jamie ran without his shoes on. He was happy and not scared to die. He would die and find Claire again, and it would be all right. There's so many things they need to say. He's probably never talked to anybody about what happened, not really. Claire moved closer to him, and he took her hand. Men were falling all around him, and he wasn't touched by the grape shot. He actually reached the British lines unscathed. He wondered why he had to kill the crew he came upon, but there's a lust in killing. I couldn't have stopped, or I would not. It's a very old feeling. I think the wish to take an enemy with you to the grave. I could feel it there, a red-hot thing in my chest and belly, and I gave myself to it. In this rage, this battle lust, he killed the four men he came upon. He found himself behind the English guns, which is not an advantageous spot to be in if you're trying to be killed by them. So he made his way back across the moor, and that's when he found Murtaugh sitting against a tussock. He'd been struck several times and had a terrible head wound, and Jamie knew he had to be dead. But as Jamie leans down, Murtaugh's eyes open. Dinna be afraid, Avalok. It doesn't hurt a bit to die. 
Jamie says too many have died because they knew him or they suffered for it. I would give my own body to save you a moment's pain. And yet I could wish to close my hand just now that I might hear you cry out and know for sure that I have not killed you too. She leaned in and kissed his bare chest. You haven't killed me. You didn't kill Myrta. And we'll find young Ian. Take me back to bed, Jamie. Having walked Culloden Moor and having gone through the incredible exhibit that you walk through as a Jacobite and you can walk through as an English officer, having gone through the entire thing and walked the moor alone, I had to separate from my family because it was too, it was just too, it was too much of everything. I read all the stones and I walked across that field. It isn't grass. It's not even. It can be boggy. There's places where your feet can get stuck. Bracken and he- heather is anything to run across. It's horrible. But yet they did. I hope if you get to Scotland that you are able to go visit And the thing about Culloden that's so interesting, you don't have to agree with the Jacobite cause, the idea that they had to have a Catholic ruler. But what that did was it changed the entire way of the Highlands life, and it altered everything. That one hour, it was a snap in time, and nothing was ever the same for a good portion of Scotland and Scottish people. And as Claire lays nearly asleep, Jamie quips, You know, I seldom wanted to go home to Leary. And yet, at least when I did, I'd find her where I'd left her. Oh, is that the kind of wife you want? The sort who stays put? He chuckles and maybe coughs a bit. He doesn't answer. And then she hears the rhythmic breathing of his sleep. <laughs> After something so heavy, Jamie is always known to infuse humor in it. It's apparent that the wounds of Culloden are still deep in Jamie, and that he carries a heavy, guilty burden about him. So we're getting more nuggets and pieces about what he experienced, and it will come and go. Chapter 55, Ishmael. Claire woke feverish and with a terrible headache, and Marceline insisted on bathing her forehead with a vinegar and water cloth, and it worked. The washing relaxed her enough to go back to sleep, but her dreams were of mine shafts and charred bodies, and she woke suddenly hearing a crash that caused her to sit up, and pain ripped through her head. It was Jamie. He had smashed his head on the cupboard and was uttering bad things in Chinese, Gaelic, and French. And finally he said, damn, God damn it to hell, and opened the window for fresh air. <laughs> Ouch. Claire yells at him, asking what the bloody hell he is doing as the light pains her eyes. He was looking for her medicine box, and his head was bleeding. She asks why he needs her medicine box, and he asks if she wants to look at his head. She didn't really, but she did. She looks at it and says, he has a very hard skull. And she kisses it. And she says, that's supposed to make it feel better. And she says, better? And he says, lots. So sweet. He wants the disinfectant that she uses for small wounds and cuts. She doesn't have any of the Hawthorne lotion ready-made. And there's a prisoner in the hold who's quite bashed up. The prisoner is from the pirate ship, but Jamie thinks he's no pirate. They pulled him from the water after one of the crews saw him dive off the Bruja. Why, Claire asks as she sips her whiskey. And she thinks this is delicious whiskey as she drinks the last drop, and it's from Jared, and it's called Magic Mist. I couldn't pronounce the Gaelic. And she sat herself upright, feeling fortified. A dram will do that for you. And Claire asks if she should look at the man, even though she feels terrible, but she's a doctor. Jamie agrees if she can stand. She's surprised that he agrees to her doing this, so it must be important. They make their way down to the hold, 
and Claire is becoming dizzy again, and she is slowly walking behind Jamie. With the amount of blood loss that she had and the blood volume expansion she has to do without adequate clean water to drink, it's going to take her a while not to feel abjectly terrible. I really wonder what her hemoglobin and hematocrit are, iron levels. She needs some blood pudding, and lots of it. The door is opened, and she can't see anything until she catches the man's eyes by the lantern light. The man's demeanor seemed he wasn't a slave. Jamie spoke to him in talky-talky. It's the polyglot language that's spoken from Barbados to Trinidad. And he said, friend, to the man. The man raises an eyebrow, and he moves his bound feet toward Jamie. Like, a friend wouldn't keep you tied up, he's saying. The man will not claim to know English or French. Claire asks if he speaks German or Dutch. Jamie thinks it's funny that he's not going to be Dutch. And Jamie doesn't know enough talky-talky to speak with him fully or ask about young Ian. In a fit of spontaneity, Jamie decides to cut the ropes binding the man's hands and ankles. He tells the man to use the chamber pot and then Claire will look after his wounds. The man goes to use it, and Jamie explains that's the worst part of being bound that way. You cannot take a piss by yourself. Claire is feeling quite unwell again, but the man was worse off than her. She had a salve for the wounds, but it wasn't his fresh wounds that interested her. It was his old injuries. They appeared to be tribal scars. Claire kept looking him over, and she's feeling queasy now, and she touches the healed slash marks on his back, and they felt an awful lot like Jamie's. She kept to her work, and the man remained still and ignoring her as she went on. He was a runaway slave and didn't want to give them anything to work with. He could be sent back, but he was the only way to information about young Ian at the present. She finishes, and Jamie speaks to him, and said he was to come with them to the cabin and eat, and the man followed behind silently. Jamie sent an ailing Claire back to bed, and she hoped she could fight off infection on her own. Jamie poured whiskey for her and the man, and he warily took it. Jamie takes one for himself as well and sits down. Jamie tells him his name is Fraser and that he's the captain, and Claire is his wife. The man speaks and says they call him Ishmael. I ain't no pirate. I be a cook. Claire remarks Murphy's going to like that. He's not a ship's cook, though. He was taken off the shore. He says again he's no pirate. Piracy is a big deal to the crown. Jamie wants to know how the Bruja took him prisoner, not where. Jamie assures him in so many words they wouldn't return him to his owner, but if he didn't talk, they might turn him over to the crown as a pirate. He was fishing, and they took him to sell. That's all. Then Jamie asks if he saw any young men, boys, on the ship. He was wide-eyed at this. Yes, there were boys, and do they want one? Jamie explains he's looking for a young kinsman who was taken and he'd be grateful for assistance in finding him. Ishmael asks what the boy looks like. Jamie says, No, you describe the boys to me. You no particular fool, man. You know that? Yes, Jamie knows that, and it's good that Ishmael knows it too. Ishmael complies while eating from the food tray Fergus provided, and Fergus watches from the door. Twelve boys speaking strange like Jamie. The boys talk like dogs fighting. So they are definitely Scots. <laughs> I don't think they sound growly, but other people do. He goes on to describe all the boys, though he only saw them once. Jamie wants details, clothes, height, weight, etc. And Claire closed her eyes, and she did hear how Jamie sounded like a big, fierce dog. Soft growling burr and the abrupt clipped sound of his consonants. Woof, she said to herself. Ishmael's voice was smooth and low. He sounded just like Joe Abernathy. 
Now she saw Joe's hands in her memory and heard him giving notes into the tape recorder. Claire was in a dream state, but came to when the words, a tall man slender, were heard. She sat up shouting, no, but told them she thinks she was dreaming and it's okay. And they go right back to their conversation. There was no resemblance between this man and Joe, and she describes them both. But if she closes her eyes, she could hear Joe's voice speaking from Ishmael. And then she realizes what she thought was a scrape on his shoulder was a newly healed scar, and she thinks she knows what it was. She's trying to remember. Had Ishmael cut off his owner's brand to prevent identification? But whose? It probably wasn't his real name, she surmised. And she thinks maybe Joe's son Lenny found an ancestor's name to use. He didn't want no slave name, remember? Maybe, maybe not. It had to do with Joe, but it reminded her of something else. Her poor, addled, fevered brain. It's trying so hard to give her clues. While Jamie was talking to the man about the Bruja's crew and such, she wanted to see Temeraire's papers. She signaled Fergus for the papers and asked where he was. He had the papers on him, and the man was in the crew's quarters. She spots the name Abernathy and wants to see the fleur-de-lis emblem. She wanted to see how large the mark was to compare to the scar on Ishmael's shoulder. It wasn't a fleur-de-lis, though. It was a 16-petaled rose, the Jacobite emblem of Charles Stewart. What patriotic exile had chosen this method of maintaining allegiance to the vanquished Stuarts? Dun, 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 for a second time. Hmm, who might it be? <laughs> Fergus is worried about Claire, and he wants to take her back to bed. And she asks him to do something for her. He says he'll do it if she goes back to bed. He takes her back to the cabin, and Jamie greets her upon return, and says she looks like spoiled custard. Such a complimenting man. She asks if he's done speaking with Ishmael. And he decides he is, and he dismisses him and instructs Fergus to take him below, get him fed and clothed properly. And he looks at Claire and says, You look awful. Had I best fetch your kit and be feeding you a wee tonic or some such? No, she says, and tells him she thinks she knows where Ishmael came from. She explains the brand, the scar, all the connections, but she doesn't talk about Joe. She believes they came from Mrs. Abernathy's on Jamaica. He hopes she's right because Ishmael wouldn't tell him, and he doesn't blame him one bit. He wouldn't want to go back. And she asks about the boys and the descriptions. He thinks two of the boys could be young Ian. But why would somebody want 12 Scottish boys and have a Jacobite brand? And does whoever has young Ian have the treasure too? She says... Temeraire needs to get a look at Ishmael in between yarns to see if he recognizes him. She is suddenly very tired. He tells her to rest, and Marcelie will bring tea. Whiskey, she says. He says, okay, she'll bring whiskey. He kisses her hot forehead and asks, better? Lots, she says. Wow. We're getting back into lots of movement. We're bringing young Ian closer and closer and closer. And the Bruja closer. And who's this Mrs. Abernathy on Jamaica? You have any ideas? If you're not reading ahead, you're going to be shocked. And why the Scottish boys? Why a Jacobite sympathizer? It's all very interesting. And it was really lovely how Willoughby took care of her. And he sutured her up with fine silk thread. That'll minimize scarring. But I wonder what that scar would look like on the inside of her arm. I mean, that had to have been 30, 40 stitches. She's likely going to have to break out the penicillin, I think, and use the last of her stash because we don't know what was on that cutlass. Next week, we get to Turtle Soup. <laughs> it is a favored chapter. 
And after interviewing Teresa of Outlander Kitchen, I cannot think of that and not think of her because she says she's Murphy. (laughs) It's the best ever. So how do you think all this is going to tie up? What do you think about Claire bringing up Joe Abernathy and his son? He changed his name to not a slave name. And if they're going to Mrs. Abernathy's on Jamaica, it makes you wonder where Joe came from. Is it possible he came from Ishmael or one of the other slaves who carried the name Abernathy? All these things are coming back around and coming back around. And we're going to have an awesome tie-in coming up. And as always, I so appreciate you listening. You are why I strive to get better every week. And I do this seriously. I started this as something for myself. And then other people started listening. And I started getting lots of downloads. And I realized I needed to take it seriously because other people were as well. And I appreciate you sharing the podcast telling people about it, joining the different social media pages, the Facebook page, Facebook group that's only for podcast listeners. Join into the Wednesday night chat on Twitter at 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 p.m. Eastern time. On Instagram, it's Dram of Outlander. On Twitter, it's Dram of Outlander. On Facebook, a Dram of Outlander. The website is adramaboutlander.com, and I really want to get comments and feedback from you. You can leave a voicemail message on the call-in line. It's 719-425-9444, or you can email me at adramaboutlander at gmail.com. I know, I'm super clever with the names, right? Oh, and one of the things I almost forgot... I did the poll on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook about ultimately who is Outlander about? Whose story is it? Well, it clearly starts out as Claire because we meet her first. And she's the narrator. She's clearly telling somebody this story. And somebody sent me the CompuServe link for... Diana saying that the story surrounds Jamie and about everybody who's interrelated to him. Everybody comes back to him. He's the pivot point. And I struggled with it and struggled with it and struggled with it. I didn't think it was strictly Claire's, but I always looked at it as about both of them. Because it seems like it would put her in a diminished role with all the other players in the stories, but it doesn't. I'm still trying to work out that piece exactly in my own head. But everybody does come around Jamie. And it does make sense. But Claire is right up there with him. This is their story. It starts out as hers. It becomes theirs. And as it moves forward, really everything that interacts, interacts with Jamie. Somehow. Because Claire's story is her interacting with him too. So it's sort of a brain shift to think of it that way. What do you think? About two-thirds of people said it was their story, and about equal amounts of people said it was his or hers. I mean, we wouldn't have Jamie's story without Claire at all. But it also makes sense that it's Jamie's story because the side stories and books Scottish Prisoner is about Jamie. We're going to get a book on his parents. So we're getting more background and information about his family. There might be one in Frank at some point. But we don't know anything about Claire's family, hardly. What about her parents? Why don't we know anything? Maybe eventually we will? Huh. It's complicated. <laughs> And lastly, how can you support the podcast? And as I said earlier, like the Facebook page, join the private podcast group, come to the Wednesday night Twitter chat, and you can make a financial contribution if you feel so led to. You can make a one-time contribution, 
or you can make a monthly contribution. And thank you so much for allowing me into your space every week. And until next time, Slange of Awe.